I want to talk about four quick things and then have a panel come up. And so the first of those is what is the Education Commission of the States and how does our work help you in doing your work here in North Carolina? The second is to look at some early learning issues and trends. The third is accountability and data. And then I want to go into teachers. And so we're going to go through this pretty quick. I want to go ahead and give a few disclaimers. I've got a lot of numbers. I've got 217 slides. I'm joking. <laughs> But I've got a lot of numbers, and some of them may be the number you agree with, some of them may be the number you don't agree with. The numbers we use are numbers that come from national reports that have been audited that can compare the states. So I may say North Carolina is first in the nation and you think they're third. I may say they're 37th and you think they're 26th. The numbers aren't important. The issue is where are you policy-wise and what are those policy levers that the people in this room have an opportunity to move to get better outcomes for the kids? And at the Education Commission of the States, we truly believe in the power of learning from experience. Every day, we provide education policymakers like you with unbiased information and opportunities for collaboration. And we do this because we know that the best education policy happens when policymakers are learning from each other. We really view ourselves as an essential and indispensable member of any team addressing education policy. I say this because we're based in Denver, Colorado, and I've got more than 50 staff, and we read every single education bill in the nation. We read the Omnibus Appropriations Bill for North Carolina. My staff enjoys that. And we pull every single education policy out of that legislation and put it in our database. So I get a lot of calls from governors and legislators and chief state school officers saying, our state's unique, we're special, we have the only problem in the nation. And I agree with all that, because everyone's special. But the problem is probably something that five or six other states are already working on. And normally, we can pull off our database seven or eight bills that have already passed and been put in place. Some might have even failed. But that's good for you to know so you don't make the same mistakes. Some might apply to North Carolina. Some may not. And that's really the service that we provide. We're in statute here in North Carolina. We're in statute in almost every one of the states in the nation, which is unique for an organization like ours. And we have seven commissioners here in North Carolina, which we're excited to be working with, along with many of you who aren't our commissioners. Governor Roy Cooper is one of our commissioners by statute, and Jeff Coltrane does a lot of work with us as a surrogate for the governor. Representative Craig Horn, who I met with this morning, is actually our steering committee member for ECS and has done a tremendous job representing this state. Senator Chad Barefoot was recently appointed as one of our commissioners. Margaret Spellings is one of our commissioners. Mark Johnson is a statutory commissioner for us, the way the statute is read. Jennifer Haygood has been appointed as a commissioner, and Cecilia Holden with the state board is a commissioner. What I love about our commissioners in each state is they are really good policymakers, but they don't always agree, and they don't always meet together. A lot of times when I come to a state and get them together, they say, wow, I haven't seen you since the governor's holiday party, because they're busy and they're working in silos. And one of the things I want to challenge you with today is, are there ways that we can look at a couple education policy issues and try to break down those silos and that partisan politics and that territorial issue to say if everyone in this room worked together on one issue, could we accomplish that for the betterment of the state of North Carolina in a year or two? So before I transition to early learning, I just want to give an acknowledgement to the reality that you've got a lot of great things that are going on here in North Carolina. You've got the kind of basis for education policy from the Brookings Plan. You've got a lot of things that have been defined or undefined from the Leandro case. But you may have the largest number of education commissions, councils, and task forces of any other state. I didn't test that, but I'm pretty sure you're close. You've got the Leandro Commission, and you've got the My NC Future, and you've got the B3 Interagency Agreement, and you've got the Joint Legislative Task Force on Ed Finance Reform, and you've got multiple commissions around teacher preparation and education credentials. These are all really good things, and it's a sign that this state is focused on how do we create the next workforce for the state of North Carolina by educating our children well. The question that I have for you, though, comes down to a little bit of governance. How many of those commissions and task forces are talking to each other? Do you know that the work you're doing on one council or one commission is not being duplicative in a different commission or a different task force? Where is the kind of umbrella oversight to unify these kind of things and make it work? That's a technical way of me asking the state relations question my staff asks every single time we go into a state. The question we ask is, can the governor and the chief state school officer, or can the legislators and the chancellor 
have dinner together. It's a simple litmus test. It's not a right or wrong. But you should be asking yourself that often here in North Carolina. Can the people who could move this policy meet for coffee, even if they disagree, and talk through some of these issues? Because that's where we see states that are really moving leaps and bounds ahead of other states and outcomes that are desired for early learning, for K-12 funding, for dual enrollment transitions, for post-secondary and workforce creation. <laughs> so when we look at early learning, North Carolina has a lot of amazing things going for it. You're one of only nine states in the nation, I'm sorry, you are one of only four states in the nation that meets nine of the ten quality ratings that were put out. That's a big achievement. When you look at the status for these quality ratings, there were two states who received all 10, Alabama and Rhode Island, and you're one of four states that received nine. That's six states that only achieved that. And so that's very impressive. The one that you didn't achieve is on professional development for your early learning educators. A requirement that there is some kind of 15 hours per year of coaching or professional development to help people continue to grow in that field. I can tell you that's a really important one a very important one because my wife is an elementary ed teacher and she reminds me that that's an important one that we need to have in more and more states. You are one of only 13 states plus the District of Columbia that requires full day kindergarten. I go into almost every state and I hear people say, we've got all day ed, we've got this. And I'm like, well, you've passed some legislation that allows districts to choose if they want to offer all day K or you're only funding about 20% of what all day K would be so the districts aren't really doing it. You're one of the few states, 13, that actually require students to attend full day kindergarten and you should be extremely proud about that. You're also including the results of this for the kindergarten entrance exams in your statewide longitudinal database and also including some social emotional learning components in there. That's not being done in many states, and it's something you should be proud of. Your funding for pre-K is very good. You actually are funding about $400 more per child. These are 2015, 2016 dollars that I'm using for a lot of these slides. $400 more per child for pre-K funding, which is tremendous. And I think there's an opportunity to continue to look at how do you get the best outcomes for that investment. But even though you've got a lot of great things, it's not always perfect. This is the one number that I think needs to be a goal for this group in moving forward. The number of four-year-olds who are in pre-K programs. Nationally, the average is about a third of them. Here in North Carolina, it's only 22% of them. Now, I know the class size bill was addressed that I think is on the governor's desk or is in some process. Jeff Coltrane can fill us in on where that is, I'm sure, a little more. It was to address some of the waiting lists there, and that's a good thing. But those waiting lists are only for four-year-olds who are in families at 75% of poverty or less. This is sometimes not a policy issue in states. Sometimes this is a cultural change in helping to educate parents in the value of some of these pre-K programs and showing them where they can get some of those access points. Achievement and accountability and data are really important ones. <clears throat> and for achievement, you've got some really good things going. But I think there's some lag between what you have at the beginning of the P20 experience and what you have at the end. I did a thorough look at your NAEP scores or the nation's report card and where do you stand on reading, on math, on science, and on writing. And for fourth grade proficiencies, you're actually ahead of the national average pretty significantly in both math and in reading. You're pretty much tied in science and writing. And I think that's something that you should be extremely proud of. The transition to eighth grade proficiency is one where I think there's probably some questions that you need to be collaboratively thinking about. I'm not advocating another counselor or commission necessarily, <laughs> but there ought to be some research done on this. When I look at the eighth grade proficiency, you're actually only beating the national average in math. You are below the national average in reading, in science, and in writing. And it's not just that you're below the national average, it's the drop from fourth grade proficiency to eighth grade proficiency that's a question that you want to be considering. The national average drop from fourth grade to eighth grade in math is actually 7%. North Carolina dropped 11%. The fourth grade proficiency on reading to the eighth grade, the national average drop is 2%. North Carolina dropped 8%. So I think on both of those numbers, I don't know what the answer is. But there's something there that you ought to be looking at in your policies to see, are we getting the best outcomes that we desire for helping these children move forward? 
Now the irony is, when you move to the next number we look at, high school graduation rates, you're back ahead of the national average. So there's kind of an area there in the middle school where there can be some focus and you may want to consider that. I'd also highlight investments a little bit, and this is always a touchy one. What is your base state aid per pupil? And this is where we get into with base state aid per pupil for K-12 and with teacher salaries, where do we rank against the other 49 states? We show the rankings, we do all this. I, I would argue that rankings are probably not the outcome goal you're trying to achieve in the state of North Carolina. The question is not where do we rank with other states, but are we educating these children to be ready to become meaningful members of our community and workforce? Because you might be able to do it for cheaper, it may cost more here. That's for you to decide as far as the appropriations. You actually are significantly below the per people spending in 2015, but this does not include two major increases in funding that have been um, approved by the legislature and the governor over the last two years. This is the last data that we had for 2015. And so we know that there's additional funding that's out there. Those numbers aren't out in an audited way for a national review against other states. But I think there's some number in there where you need to look at, and I've heard with a lot of you I've met with in the past, you know, where are we nationally ranking? That's one way to look at it. I'd argue you want to look at it instead. What are the outcomes that we are achieving in the K-12 system, and are they meeting the needs of what we want for our society in North Carolina and for the workforce needs that businesses are talking to us about? Accountability and data, I want to go into these pretty quickly, but they're big issues where you're doing well, but maybe not completely to what you could achieve. So on accountability, you are one of only 13 states that is utilizing an A through F rating system. That's actually the majority, the largest number of states using one kind of rating system. There are 10 states that use a numerical system, like 1 to 100 or 1 to 10. There's some states that use like above average, average, below average. But 13 for an A through F report card is the largest number of states. And you've been pretty significantly committed to this because you've been with this program for a while, which is good. A lot of states are changing accountability systems because of their Every Student Succeeds Act requirements. But the one thing I noticed in looking at your A through F rating system is that 80% of that grade is based on proficiency at a class. So did you meet the fourth grade proficiency? If enough of your kids met it at that school, your school's gonna get an A. Only 20% of that is based upon what would be considered growth. And so if you have a school that has significant problems, they may be growing at a higher rate than even your best school, but it's not gonna show up in this. Because of that, I mean, I look at your system and it looks like it may be more a barometer of poverty in North Carolina than it is necessarily showing you which individual elementary schools are getting us the best possible outcomes and what can we go learn from those teachers and administrators to share with others. The numbers I would use to express that is that of your A schools, only 10% of them have their student population at 50% or higher poverty. Of your F schools, 98% of them have their student population at 50% poverty or higher. And so that's something that you could look at. The average in most states is proficiency only covers about 50% of your grade. And growth and some other factors are included in to show how you're making progress towards the goals. Data is one where you've got some amazing successes also, but you're not to the finish line yet. You're one of only 16 states that actually connects data across all of the P20 systems. And that is a Herculean effort. I mean, honestly, getting early learning and K-12 to even adopt some kind of a data system and have the data coming in, getting that to connect with community colleges and with higher ed and with workforce needs, that takes a lot of work. You have this data system in one centralized area. As we talk about governance and who's in charge of which commission, the fact that you've been able to get a data system in one spot is an achievement. But some of the things with your data that's interesting is there's probably more data that you've collected than many of you are even utilizing. And so the data for policymakers is not being utilized to figure out where can we move some of these needles to have better outcomes. Chancellor Spellings was in Politico this morning, as I saw, talking about the need for more data on higher ed outcomes. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we knew every graduate of a North Carolina college or university what is their salary and where are they working five years out so that we can tell students coming in, here's what you should be looking at and here's what it's going to cost to get to that area. We have the need to share this data more across systems, but where you really need to consider how to share it is with teachers, administrators, and parents. There are very few parents who probably know you're collecting this data. 
If they had this data in an identifiable manner that they could understand, they could probably help you a lot in making some changes even at individual school levels. We had a couple of states that I highlight because they actually inserted data coaches into their school systems. The theory there is if I'm an elementary school teacher and I keep being told that my students are not proficient at third grade math, I probably don't know why they're not proficient because I can't read the data. That's not my job. I'm not a statistician. But if I have a data coach that comes in and says, look, it's only fractions that the third graders are failing at. When you teach fractions in the year, and could we change your curriculum to help get that better, they saw dramatic increases in proficiency. And that's an example of using data for a really, really positive way. They gave out some grants for a few data coaches and saw some significant changes in how that data was utilized by schools. I'm going to transition to teachers, which is just about the last one. And you've got a lot of amazing policies here for teachers. I throw out an issue like this, and almost everybody says, oh boy, here we go. We're going to hear about salaries, and we're going to discuss salaries. There's a lot more to this than just salaries. And it's kind of also about how you're doing recruitment and retention. I know we had a committee that um, released a major report last week that I know Chancellor Spellings have been involved with talking about some of this. But you've got some really interesting things here in North Carolina that other states haven't done yet, and you're already seeing some successes. The first is you actually connect teacher supply and demand. There are only nine states that do this. And so by having the required state of teaching profession report that comes out, you actually have an opportunity to look at what is the supply and demand and where are the needs. I get calls from governor's office all the time, and I mean this respectfully, they say, we've got a teacher shortage. What are we gonna do for this year? I've got 7,000 openings. Are there other states that I can just go and start advertising in the newspaper on? How do we get these teachers in here? The teacher shortage is an epidemic across America. Six years ago, we had 750,000 college students who were enrolled in a teacher prep program. Three quarters of a million college students wanted to be a teacher. Last year, we had 499,000 college students enrolled in a teacher prep program. We dropped 30% in five years in the number of college students who even want to join the profession. So this is an issue where looking at supply and demand and where there are really needs is a really important move for you as a state, and you should congratulate yourself for that. You also have some teachers leaving the profession issues that you are looking at, which many states are not looking at across the entire state. This is old data. This is the last national survey that was out. And it's 2011-12 to 2012-13. You had 5.5% of your teachers leaving the profession. The national average was 7.7. .7. I don't have other national data to compare you against. But I know that just last year, the Department of Public Instruction released a report that showed that your teachers leaving the profession was actually 13.5%. So it's been growing. We don't have the national data to compare, but it's something that you need to be monitoring and are obviously considering with the number of commissions that are out there. You also have four really key policies that many states haven't even considered that are focused on meeting your demand needs, and you need to continue to look at how those are working. One is that you're one of only 23 states that provides differential pay for high need schools. Differential pay is the only way to use a word that says you provide starting bonuses or bonuses or that you have some salary increase above what other teachers would be. And for those high need schools, that's very important. You're one of only seven states that provides loan forgiveness for teachers in high need schools. That's a really small number of states that are willing to look at that. But if you have a high need school and you can help get a teacher in there and you can keep them there for multiple years, you're probably going to be in a much better shape in the long run. You're one of only 15 states that provides differential pay for shortage subject areas. There's a lot of teachers that are out there. My, wife, my daughter is very interested in becoming a kindergarten teacher, and I keep trying to help her understand there's a lot of kindergarten teachers out there. You ought to be a high school science teacher, or a high school math teacher, or special ed, or foreign language, because those are the high need subject areas that states are really having the biggest problem in filling. And you provide, as one of 15 states, some opportunities for bonuses for people going into those positions. You also provide loan forgiveness for those that are going into certain subject areas. But I'd be remiss to not touch teacher salaries, so here we go. Let's have some fun with this one. There's been a lot of money and a lot of opportunities that have been put in to raise teacher salaries. Where you rank nationally, I'll show you, but that's not the question. The issue is, are you investing what's needed for quality individuals 
to help you achieve outcomes in your schools that meet the needs of North Carolina. In 2014 and 2015, teacher salaries actually went up 6.3%, and that's good. But when you start to look at some trends, they only went up 0.3% in 2015 to 2016. And when I throw up an 11-year average, they actually went down 9.9%. All of this is before some of the funding increases that have been appropriated and that have been put out there. I want to make sure that disclaimer is there. But it's an issue that you need to figure out what is the right number and how does that work. The average teacher salary for 2015 and 2016, again, before some of these increases were appropriated, the average for the nation was about 58,000, and the average for North Carolina was about 48,000. I know that if we look at some estimates, which we don't usually like to do, we like to wait until we have the data and it's been audited, but if we look at estimates, last year's was actually $49,800. So almost a $2,000 increase in teacher salaries that happened in one year, which is a positive outlook. Where do you rank nationally? Well, before any of the increases, you ranked 40th in salaries. And if we use the guesstimate that's out there right now, it'd be 35th. I don't think where you rank matters. I think are you achieving the goals and outcomes you want for the children to become part of your workforce is where you really need to have your time and effort spent. And lastly, I want to touch on two quick issues because you should really be proud of a couple of these. One is high school and college readiness. North Carolina is one of the states that we highlight in so many of our publications around your dual enrollment programs. We have 13 model policies, you meet 11 of them. Congratulations. On AP, we have nine model policies, you meet eight of them. There's hardly any states that are at that juncture. And the same on early college and high schools. So these are really big programs that are important because you're breaking down that barrier between how you go from high school to some post-secondary certification. And study after study shows that if you get one dual enrollment or AP course or early college high school opportunity as a high school student, your chances of getting a degree or a certification go up exponentially compared to those who didn't get that opportunity. You're also one of only six states in which the state pays dual enrollment tuition. This is a very big investment and it's one you should be extremely proud of. I have to tell you that we go across the country and everybody's talking dual enrollment and AP and what they can do and how they can transition, but it doesn't matter if some of these families don't have the funds to pay for that dual enrollment course or even for the test that the AP charges to see if you get college credit. This is a really big investment and it's one that's going to pay off quite well for you over the long haul. I'd also tell you that if you put a little bit more money into paying for this tuition, you should think about putting it into PR. It is an issue that most parents don't know about or completely understand. If they did, they would take advantage of it more and more. My wife and I have three children. Our son is a freshman in college. Our two daughters are in high school. They started taking AP courses their freshman year. They all yelled at me because of it. They all are doing well, and they're all having college credit examples that they can move forward with. I'm fortunate enough to understand that because I read these kind of reports, but I can't tell you how many peers that I have in the same high school my children are attending who had no idea that there's even a college credit offered at their high school. Public relations is where some states are doing an exemplary job. It's not a policy lever or funding, it's teaching and culture change so that parents understand how to engage in these policies. And on post-secondary, you've got some other great things going, which I think it's important to talk about quickly. One is on accessibility. We rate states on four key areas of accessibility. Do you have a transferable core of lower division courses so it's easy to move back and forth, especially with some dual enrollment? You do. Do you have a statewide guarantee of a transfer for an associate's degree? You do, and that's tremendous. We give you kind of a partial on reverse transfer because it's a, a systems decision on reverse transfer and what you can do. It's not a statewide, but you should look at making that statewide. I can't tell you how many states are seeing big successes with their adult learners who have 60 or 70 or 80 credit hours but dropped out of college at some juncture because life hit them. Maybe they had a child, maybe they ran out of money, maybe they just got tired of the university. And we found them to charge them for the loans that they owe. But we failed to catch up with them and say, you know what, if you just come take six hours at the community college and we can get you an associate's degree, your quality of life will probably be much better. This is a really important one on reverse transfers. And the last is on statewide common course numbering. I've talked with a lot of people in this room about this and everybody says, oh my gosh, who would be in charge of that? How would you do it? Who would govern doing that? 
But states that have common course numbering for post-secondary are seeing a lot of very important increases in college graduates and students being able to move back and forth. You actually spend a good amount of money on higher ed. I don't know if that's what I'm supposed to say when higher ed people are in the room, but compared to other states, you actually have put more money in than some other states on the national average for your funding in higher ed. And I think that's an investment for the state and one that you should be proud of. You also have an average in-state tuition at four-year institutions, which is almost, or it's over, $2,500 cheaper. And that's a really important bargaining price when you're trying to keep your best and brightest in North Carolina to stay in North Carolina and become part of your community. So we're going to have a panel come up here and talk, but I just want to kind of push a little bit before they get here that there are so many opportunities on some of these policies. And when I'm in states, I usually hear from a lot of the policymakers that, oh my gosh, the politics are just terrible, or there's no way we can get this one silo to work with that silo. Early learning is hard to talk with, or K-12 doesn't listen, or community colleges are disconnected. We see a lot of states that go beyond those problems and actually solve it. I mean, I see some states where the chief and the SHEO are probably texting each other three times a day. The chief in charge of K-12 and the SHEO in charge of higher ed. I see states where the governor's office may not get along with anybody, but they've got one staff person who's been tasked with having an open line of communication with everybody, even if we don't agree with each other. There are ways to work through some of these policies and find some meaningful outcomes that will be well worth it for the state of North Carolina.